Good afternoon and welcome to the June 2023 Major Mondays webinar. Today is subrogation as a term of art, the difference between lien, subrogation, and offset rights. And good afternoon. As always, this is live question and answer. So if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the go to webinar box uh, and we'll get to them at the conclusion. So uh, I wanted to bring up the webinar we had in May, just last month. Uh, keep, in, keep the context in mind here when we talk about these three different rights in New York and New Jersey. Uh, the whole idea here is no double recovery for the same injury that was the predicate for payment of workers' comp benefits. So we talked about how Section 29 and Section 40 were drafted by the legislatures to avoid a double recovery to the petitioner or the claimant. Today's discussion is the three distinct rights granted by each statute, how to keep them separate, and how they apply practically. So this is sort of the um, impetus for this webinar. So the industry use of subrogation is slightly confusing. So in the field of workers' compensation, basically anything pertaining to Section 40 or Section 29 in New Jersey or New York, uh, basically third-party action recoveries, is generally referred to as subrogation. Uh, if you look in the claim notes in your claim files, generally you'll see you know, anything pertaining to third-party issues will often bear the designation subrogation on it, and in-house recovery teams are often called subrogation departments. So in the workers' compensation industry, subrogation basically is a shorthand for risk transfer in the context of workers' comp cases. But it's actually something different, and we're gonna get into that in a moment, not to get too overly technical here. Um, so let's talk about the first statutory right we get in both states lien and reimbursement rights. So uh, apologies for getting a little lawyerly on you guys, but we're gonna launch right off with a quote from Black's Law Dictionary. So what is a lien? A legal right or interest that a creditor has in another's property lasting until, lasting usually until a debt or duty that it secures is satisfied. So the lien language in workers' comp law section 29.1, the carrier, it actually uses the word lien, shall have a lien on the proceeds of any recovery from such other for compensation paid under this chapter. What do they mean by under this chapter? Compensation paid under the workers' comp law. Translation, a reimbursement right for amounts paid in medical and indemnity. Uh, in New Jersey, we use section 40 B and C, uh, and it's a little more nebulous, but we'll get into that in a moment. So, carriers shall be entitled to be reimbursed for medical expenses incurred in compensation payments Notice this language here, theretofore paid to injured employee. Um, Section 40B provides the calculation if the third party recovery exceeds the carrier's liability. And Section 40C provides the calculation if it's the inverse. Uh, so as a practical matter, since we're only gonna have offset rights and we're gonna see this in a later example, we only have offset rights to the extent that the claimant receives something from the third party settlement. Section 40B is really the one that pertains to offset rights in New York uh, or in New Jersey, but we'll get into that in a moment. But if you look at the language from uh, Section 40 and from Section 29, you can see that the legislature is referring to past benefits paid. So when we're talking about what a lien is and what we're gonna get reimbursed for, think of everything that we've cut checks for to date. Uh, I want to talk about Section 40, though, because I see this a lot, and um, you know, maybe I'm just a stickler, uh, but I do think it just you know behooves the practice in general to get the terminology right and keep these issues straight. Um, so, in uh, in New Jersey, the lien is generally interpreted to consist of three things: med, temp, and perm. Uh, the lien operates statutorily, meaning petitioner's obligation to reimburse exists independent of any notice to the petitioner. Uh, sometimes they'll try and tell you, no, you needed to serve notice pursuant to Section 40D. That is actually not what Section 40D says. The case law is clear that the lien that the petitioner has to repay operates by virtue of statute. What Section 40D does, and why I always recommend serving the notice anyway, uh, serving proper notice under Section 40D obligates the third party defendant to inquire into the lien and the litigation costs from third party counsel and to reimburse the carrier before paying petitioner dollar one. So that means, you know, once the case is settled and the, you know, the releases are swapped and whatever else they need to do, they're actually supposed to cut you a check from that settlement sent directly to the carrier before they send the money to petitioner's counsel. How it generally ends up working is petitioner's counsel gets a check for the full amount and then haggles with you and then they cut you a check from their trust account. Um, Section 40D, a proper notice gives you all the leverage in the world. 
Uh, we actually got into this in a case where, granted, there wasn't that much at stake. It was only $15,000. Uh, but because we had served proper notice and could prove it, um, the court actually awarded awarded uh, the third party attorney his fee and costs and gave us the entirety of the rest of it and directed the defendants to pay us directly. So section 40D is pretty powerful when you do it right. Um, now, here's the thing that kind of grinds my gears a bit. It is very, 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 very common in New Jersey for an order approving settlement, you might hear it called the section 22, uh, PPD award, permanent partial disability, to state respondent reserves section 40 lien rights on future benefits. That is, not a, that is not a thing. There is no such thing as a lien on something you haven't paid yet. Remember, a lien is a secured past debt. So in both New York and New Jersey, it's a debt for benefits we previously paid. What would be the better wording in that context if you wanted to reserve rights under section 40B? Uh, respondent reserves all future rights under section 40, including the right to a credit slash offset against further compensation. Uh, every law judge on earth is gonna know what you mean when you say credit slash offset, and it keeps the issue of the section 40 lien and our future offset rights distinct. So let's do a practical lien example. And because the lien component calculation is actually not that bad, we're gonna do New York and New Jersey simultaneously. So let's say we've paid 30K, third party settlement is 100,000, attorney's fee is exactly one third and the cost of disbursements are 1500. Nice even round numbers we're working with here. So section 29, we get our calculation from Kelly versus state insurance fund. There's gonna be more chat around that one a little later in this webinar, but basically uh, attorney's fee plus cost of litigation, cost of disbursements divided by the gross settlement equals the cost of litigation percentage. So attorney's fee plus cost and disbursements over 100K equals 34.83%. As a practical matter in both New York and New Jersey, where you're gonna get this information from is from what's typically called a closing statement or proposed settlement distribution. A lot of attorneys will be reluctant to give it to you because there might still be some expenses that trickle in through the door uh, after a settlement agreement is reached, but they absolutely should have an idea of what their costs and disbursements are. And that's why, especially in New York, you'll leave yourself a little wiggle room in the consent to adjust the numbers if needed. Um, but they should be, if they're not, if they say it's a confidential settlement, well, number one, that's bogus because we have a lien on it. So you can't really hide it from us. You, you know, it's a statutorily guaranteed lien. But if they're really that, you know, insistent upon it, they can at least give you, give you their costs and disbursements, their attorney's fee and the total settlement amount. At bare minimum, they owe you that to do the calculation right. So um, we reduced third in New York still with section 29, we reduced 30,000 by 34.83%. That means we get 19,551 as our maximum reimbursement. In New Jersey, attorney's fees are capped at one third and expenses of suit are capped at 750. And you can find this in section 40E. Um, the reason I'm emphasizing capped is because once you get over settlements of 750,000 uh, in New Jersey, rule one colon 21-7 of the rules of court actually has a step down for amounts over 750K. So you're allowed one third on the first 750, the next 750 it's 30%, the next 750 it's 25%, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you actually take the average attorney's fee, you just look at whatever they're getting. And again, this is why a closing statement is extremely helpful because they'll have done this work for you. Um, you look at whatever their total fee is and divide it by the gross settlement amount. If it's less than one third, they do not get to lop off a third from our lien. It's whatever the percentage actually is. If it shakes out to 28%, our lien is only reduced by 28%. Similarly, let's say the costs or disbursements are only $500. We do not take off 750. This is why we get this information first, because a lot of times you'll have attorneys assume they know the calculation and just send you a check for what they think they owe you, lopping off a third in 750. And that's not always the case. And in one of our prior New Jersey cases, we actually caught an attorney doing that exact thing and it, he actually ended up owing us about a grand, which we took as a credit against the section 22 OAS. So, you know, sometimes you can catch these guys with their hands in the cookie jars, I like to say. Uh, that's why you want the closing statement. So in New Jersey, we reduce the lien uh, by one third to 20,000 and then we subtract 750. Um, <clears throat> once we reduce it to 20,000 and subtract 750, that leaves 19,250 as our maximum section 40 reimbursement. What does this mean for offset rights? In New York, the petitioners, well, claimant, 
New York, the claimant's net is 45,615.67. That is the amount that's available for a future credit or offset. In New Jersey, it's 45,916.67 to the petitioner. And speaking of future credits slash offsets, so in both New York and New Jersey, the carrier is entitled to pay future benefits at a reduced rate to the extent of what the petitioner or claimant receives from the third party settlement after their attorney's litigation's costs come out and after the lien reimbursement is deducted. You'll hear this referred to as a petitioner or claimant's net settlement. In New York, uh, this comes from section 29.3 and 4 in the concept of deficiency compensation. In New Jersey, as we mentioned earlier, you'll find it in section 40B. Again, the language is a little confusing. It says released from such liability, but uh, we're gonna show you how that actually applies in terms of offset rights. So a word on New York, which is very quickly. So both New York and New Jersey have offset rights in the statute. New York actually requires express reservation of those rights in a section 29.5 consent agreement or else the rights are waived. Uh, what is the court's justification for this? So the claimant has the full picture of the settlement and how it impacts their workers' comp benefits before they agree to anything. New Jersey does not technically have a written consent requirement, but best practices dictate memorializing terms in a writing uh, and reserving it on a settlement order if applicable. All right, so let's start off with New Jersey offset rights. So thanks to the language in Section 40B of released from such liability, the New Jersey Supreme Court interpreted this as requiring an acceleration of benefits. This is Owens versus CNR Waste Material uh, in the event of a permanency award. It is the bane of uh, all workers' compensation defense attorneys because we would love to pay at the one-third rate, uh, but unfortunately there's this nasty little bugaboo of a case out there. Um, <clears throat> So ongoing temporary disability and medical are payable at the one third rate, but with a PERM award, like a section 22, a uh, carrier pays one third of the award upfront and is relieved from benefit payments thereafter. That is what released from such liability in section 40B means. Uh, note that this one third payment upfront is not a payment of compensation. Uh, it is representative of our contribution to the petitioner's litigation costs and at least that's the legal gymnastics the Supreme Court used to get around the issue of it otherwise being a potential commutation of benefits. Uh, so you pay one third up front, and then you take a complete holiday. We try to negotiate ongoing one third uh, payments, you know, on a weekly basis, but most adversaries won't go for this. If they do, get it in writing so that you have something memorialized and it's more of a settlement agreement. Um, obviously, paying one third weekly is much more favorable to us because you know, the petitioner could pass away tomorrow and we may never pay the entirety of the award. So we would rather be able to do the reduced benefit payments weekly than this lump sum up front, but the law says what it says. So continuing with New Jersey here, the easiest way to square it in your head, because this can get a little confusing, is uh, I urge you to work in weeks. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, how many weeks of a holiday from payments does the petitioner's net settlement buy me? Let's use some nice even numbers again for this example. Petitioner's net for the third party settlement is 30K. A section 22 award for 120,000 payable 300 per week uh, for 400 weeks is what's entered. Uh, let's, we're gonna try first to negotiate paying $100 a week for the first 100 weeks. Why 100 weeks, 30,000 divided by the weekly rate, that's the petitioner's net divided by the weekly benefit rate. Uh, <clears throat> if they don't go for it, how it likely ends up working under Owens, we pay the petitioner 40,000 pursuant to the OAS, one third of the total amount, we pay that up front, and then we're released from such liability for the first 100 weeks. Again, net settlement from the third party action divided by weekly benefit rate. The remaining 300 weeks of the 400 on the OAS are payable at $300 per week, and we resume those benefit payments in week 101 after our 100 weeks of an offset. Uh, reopener rights, this is from uh, Andre Chak versus Elmora Bake Shop. Uh, reopener rights are calculated from the last date the payments would have been made. Practically, this only matters when uh, the third party settlement exceeds the OAS, uh, such that we never actually resume payments. Um, but in that situation where we pay one third up front and then there are no future payments on the horizon, because we have a complete holiday thanks to the size of the net third party settlement, uh, you calculate two years from the date the last payment would have been due 
per the order. So you go out the number of weeks on the order and count two years from that date. That's how long they have to file for a reopener. All right, let's look at New York. And I won't belabor this too much because we have a couple different presentations on how the numbers work. Uh, I encourage you to look at our webinar archives. I think I had one in November uh, 2022 about crunching the numbers that really dove into this. But um, for the purpose of being a, a completionist, let's look at it today as well. So in New York, it depends on whether future ben benefits are speculative or non-speculative. Side note, on the, as long as we're talking about speculation here, my guess is eventually they're going to move away from this distinction and just embrace Burns versus Varielli for all types of payments. That seems to be the way it's headed based on the case decisions that are coming out over the past five years or so, but we're not there yet. So we have this uh, calculation we got to work with with speculative versus non-speculative. So speculative future benefits, temporary disability, obviously, right? They could have reduced earnings. Uh, they could be found not attached to the labor market. They could return to work. Temporary disability is speculative. LWEC, same reason. That's why it's speculative. And medical treatment is always speculative. So these we pay at the burns rate. What is the burns rate? It's that cost of litigation percentage we calculated earlier, which is uh, the attorney's fee plus costs and disbursements divided by gross settlement. Um, so typically that means we would pay temporary disability, LWAC payments, or medical treatment at approximately a one-third rate. Uh, schedule loss of use, permanent total, and death benefits are non-speculative, and so we have to follow the formula in Kelly. So let's look at a couple examples here. Example one, let's say we have a $100,000 third-party settlement, our lien is 25K, the attorney's fee is 33,000, and costs are 1,000. Nice even numbers again, we have a cost of litigation percentage per Kelly of 34%. The lien reimbursement is 25,000 minus 34. 34% of 25,000 is 8,500. Uh, so 16,500 is our maximum current reimbursement. Claimant's net is 49,500. So let's assume a 25% LWAC of 250 weeks at $300 per week. Under Burns, we pay 34% of the permanent partial disability benefits which shakes out to 102 per week and any medical at 34% uh, until 49,500 in our holiday is used up. The holiday expires after 165 weeks, assuming there's no medical eating it up in the interim. Uh, 49,500 divided by the weekly benefit rate of 300 and the full rate resumes for the remaining 85 weeks. So Burns is actually kind of uh, easy and it's just you pay it approximately the one third rate on an ongoing basis. Now let's deal with non-speculative future benefits. So let's assume we have a perm total classification, $900 per week with a calculated present value of 600. We've paid 300,000 to date. Uh, the third party settlement is 500,000 with 163,333.33 in attorney's fees and 10,000 in costs. Cost of litigation percentage is 34.67. Our total benefit under the law uh, equals our uh, prior lien and the amount we're being relieved from. So that's calculated as our lien or what we've paid to date, plus the estimated future value of 600,000. The uh, courts have said that that is our total benefit under section 29. So what is our uh, share of litigation costs on our total benefit of 900,000? Again, that's the 600 present value of the PTD plus the 300 we've paid to date. Uh, so, taking 34.67% of 900K is $312,030. So, we subtract our equitable share from our gross lien, 300,000 minus 312.30 equals negative 12,030. So, because we have a negative number here, we actually end up paying fresh money in this instance. The claimant's net is now 500,000 minus attorney's fee and costs and disbursements plus 12,030 in the fresh money we have to pay equals 338,696.67. When do payments resume, AKA deficiency compens compensation, 338,696.67 over the weekly benefit rate of 900 per week, it's 376.33 weeks. So after about seven years of no payments at all, thanks to the uh, non-speculative future benefit calculation in Kelly, we take a complete holiday for the first seven years, and then we pick up payments at the full rate again after 376 weeks. 
I know it's a little complicated, but um, there are some prior webinars on how the math really works out where we dive in. So I would encourage you to check those out. And uh, obviously, I'm always thrilled to talk about this kind of stuff. It's uh, my bread and butter. So anytime anyone wants to pick up the phone or email me, I'm always happy to dive into this. A uh, brief word on MVA cases. We have webinars on this topic too. So um, Section 291A says we uh, do not have a lien on amounts paid in lieu of first party benefits. This amounts to a 50K carve out to our lien rights. This is for motor vehicle accident cases. Um, note the language is specific though. We do not have credit and offset rights on amounts paid in lieu of first party benefits. Uh, to be very clear, this does not mean you do not have Section 29 rights until you pay 50,000. That's just the threshold for uh, at what point any future benefits are no longer in lieu of first party benefits. That's the maximum allowed under the no fault law for loss of earnings and medical treatment. Uh, first party benefits is defined as basic economic loss less certain statutory offsets. Basic economic loss includes necessary medical treatment provided within the first year. It is ascertainable that further treatment may be required. Uh, and the definition of basic economic loss includes indemnity up to 2K per month for not more than three years. Why do I mention this? Well, this means you would have lien slash offset rights uh, on dollar one on medical treatment if there is no treatment in the first year, regardless of whether you have paid 50K. Now, this is a very anomalous situation. It does not happen very often. If a claimant is legitimately injured, chances are they're going to the ER right on the date of loss, and right then and there, your uh, the 50K carve out is gonna apply. Where would this pop up? Well, maybe the person has a knee injury and then they retire, and then a year later, you know, their cousin who got a comp award in New York says, dude, you should go after a schedule loss of use. And then they're gonna go out there and get a permanency opinion, but a year has gone by in the interim, well, it doesn't matter. Um, this medical treatment is no longer in lieu of first party benefits because there was no treatment in the first year. Again, doesn't happen all that often, but it's worth knowing. Uh, the indemnity thing happens quite often, however. So you have lien and offset rights on indemnity over 2K per month uh, or more than three years after the date of loss, regardless of whether you've paid 50K. So uh, if we're looking at section 29 offset rights, you know, let's say we're paying at exactly a one third rate um, and say the weekly benefit rate is $900, right? In a month, that's $3,600 payable. $1,600 exceeds $2,000. So we would be entitled to pay $1,600 at the one third rate. All right, uh, the third statutory right, subrogation. And then we're wrapping up here. I know this has uh, been a wordy presentation, uh, but we're getting to the finish line. So uh, dipping back into Black's Law Dictionary, what is subrogation? The substitution of one party for another, uh, whose debt the party pays, entitling the paying party to rights, remedies or securities that would otherwise belong to the debtor. So despite the use in the industry for anything pertaining to risk transfer whatsoever, actual subrogation under the law is suing the third party in the shoes of the petitioner or claimant. Where do we get this in the workers' comp law in New York and New Jersey? Section 292 in New York, Section 40F in New Jersey. Both states have a notice requirement after a waiting period. In New York, either six months after the awarding of comp or one year after the date of loss, whichever comes sooner, uh, upon 30 days notice to the claimant. In New Jersey, one year after the date of loss upon 10 days written demand to the petitioner. Uh, as a practical matter, I recommend either affecting personal service of this, if you're under the gun and coming up against the statute of limitations, uh, or if you're serving it well in advance and have ample time, I recommend doing certified or registered mail. Um, we like to attach the proof of service and a copy of the notice as an exhibit to our complaint to foreclose any affirmative defense by the defendants that we don't have standing to bring this suit. Um, what does the case caption end up looking like? Carrier ASO, that's as subrogee of, petitioner slash claimant versus third party defendant. All right, practical takeaways, and then we'll get to any questions. Number one, uh, remember, despite the use of subrogation as a term of art, both New York and New Jersey grant us three distinct rights one of which is actually subrogation. Uh, keep these rights distinct and use proper nomenclature. Again, um, it really just keeps everything much cleaner. If it, say on a New Jersey OAS, you say uh, respondent reserves future credit and offset rights instead of respondent reserves lien rights. 
remember that New York requires an express reservation of future rights in a 29-5 consent letter or it's waived. Um, know how to perfect lien rights in New Jersey pursuant to section 40D, we talked about that. Uh, no reimbursement calculations in New York and New Jersey. Uh, cost litigation percentage in New York versus our statutory caps of one third for the attorney's fee and 750 for expenses of suit in New Jersey. And future offset calculations, Owens versus CNR waste and the acceleration on PPD benefits in New Jersey. Uh, Kelly versus state insurance fund for non-speculative future benefits and the cost of litigation percentage calculation, Burns v. Variali for speculative future benefits, et cetera. Uh, here's some suggested New Jersey order approving settlement language since I've been you know, griping about what I see in these settlement orders quite frequently. Uh, respondent reserves all rights pursuant to NJSA 34 15-40, including but not limited to the rights to a lien, reimbursement, a future credit and offset against additional benefits and or subrogation. There we've hammered out all three rights on the record. Again, none of those are actually necessary in New Jersey. It just keeps everything clean and keeps everyone aware of our rights and forecloses any future arguments about it. And uh, finally, know how to actually subrogate if necessary. Know your deadlines, know you have to serve the notice in advance of the statute of limitations uh, and make sure you're serving proper notice under the statute. All right, so with that, Let's see if we have any questions before we uh, adjourn until July. Let's see, we'll pop this out. No, I do not see any questions, which I'm going to take to mean I did an excellent job. So thank you, everyone. I'm just kidding. Uh, but seriously, thank you for attending. And I hope to see everyone uh, next month. In the interim, happy 4th of July. Enjoy the summer, everybody.